ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to get our afternoon session underway. Um, slightly different uh, format uh, to, to this, this panel session. Uh, we will have some opening remarks from Mark Field, who is the Minister of State for Asia and Pacific at the Foreign Office, uh, and then has to run away and uh, do his democratic duty, unfortunately. But uh, we will follow that up with a discussion uh, featuring some of the leading figures in business, both in, um, in the UK and um, in China in terms of uh, analyzing the, the relationship between our countries and um, on a, on, from an economic and, and business point of view. Uh, Peter Budd of Arup, uh, Dr. Xiang Bing, the founding dean of the Chung Kong Graduate School of Business, Sir Jerry Grimston, who's the chairman of Barclays at Bank PLC and Standard Life Magazine, Sun Yu, who is the uh, chief executive of the Bank of China UK and one of the most respected Chinese business figures in London, and Sherry Madeira of our hosts at the City of London, who is uh, the, the, the expert's expert on all these issues. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Right Honourable Mark Field. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to London, for those who are not already resident here, uh, and indeed, of course, welcome to the heart of my own uh, parliamentary stamping ground here at the cities of London and Westminster, which I've represented for the last 17 years in Parliament. Now, I must say I feel particularly blessed as a politician, as in my view, I do represent the single most prestigious constituency in the United Kingdom. Now, I appreciate that's an opinion that is hotly contested by at least, at least 649 people working nearby. But uh, as the Minister of State for Asia and the Pacific, I also have the privilege of representing the government and UK interests in the most dynamic region on earth. Without doubt, uh, I needn't say to all of you here, much of that dynamism over the past decade or so, and indeed in the decades to come, emanates from China. So I want to thank the Centre for Policy Studies uh, and the Corporation of London for bringing us all together here today. It is always a great pleasure to get together with others who share my innate enthusiasm for China and my determination to build the strongest of partnerships between our countries. Um, I must confess I had visited China on three occasions prior to becoming a minister uh, and of course have done so twice since and uh, will look forward to a third visit in July. Um, but I regret and apologies um, already in advance because of votes in the House, I'm unable to stay for the panel discussion. But nevertheless, I am very pleased to have this opportunity, if I may, to illustrate that doing business with China and developing a strong people-to-people a -people relationship between our two countries is front and center of the government's priorities for this relationship. The government is helping to broaden and to deepen the relationship with China across a whole range of fronts. When our own Prime Minister visited China earlier this year, she set out her clear aspiration for the UK and China to be partners for the long term. Like all friendships, of course, this requires both parties to uh, commit to work together, but also to make space for differences, and there are always going to be differences, to be aired uh, and talked through. And I'm very pleased to say uh, that she and President Xi were in absolute agreement about that. Now, as a politician, building a strong partnership with China is, of course, a personal priority. That's because China so patently has a major role to play in so many of the pressing issues that affect the future, not just of this nation, but of the world at large. And I've seen that in much of the work I've done deputizing for um, the Foreign Secretary uh, at the UN Security Council, where it is fair to say that China, as a P5 member, has tended in the past to hide itself slightly under a bushel, and it is doing a little bit less of that now. It, uh, I wouldn't say it's being overly assertive, but it nonetheless recognizes uh, that an orderly world beyond its own borders is very much in its own interests going forward. So we look at tackling the global challenges and threats that lie before us, how we can grow our respective economies in the years ahead and ensure that all of our peoples become more prosperous. Clearly, the relationship between the UK and China will only become more important as the UK pursues its future beyond the European Union. 
Now, thanks to the efforts of this government, our push to strengthen the relationship starts from a very sound base. The UK is already one of China's most important investment partners. Bilateral trade, as many will know, is at a record level. China is, at the moment, our third largest trading partner, behind the EU and the United States, respectively. And British exports to China have grown by almost two-thirds since 2010. We are and remain the destination for more Chinese investment than any other European country, bar the Netherlands. And this investment is providing a boost across the regions of the UK, as well as closer to home here in the financial and professional services centre that is the City of London. But a lot of that work includes uh, new work in nuclear power in the West Country, scientific research in Manchester, and manufacturing in Scotland. Investment has not been blown off course by the result, the surprise result of the EU referendum, indeed far from it. In the two years since that vote, Chinese investors have demonstrated their confidence in the UK's economic future with acquisitions of Odeon and UCI and major investments in the construction sector in Sheffield and in Croydon. And may I also say this, one thing that has been very evident to me in all of my uh, visits, not just actually to China, but within the Asian region, we have to recognize that the big job producers of the future will be in areas such as the fourth industrial revolution, whether that's robotics, AI, whether it's in medical diagnostics, in pharmaceuticals. A lot of these are areas, and um, particularly obviously in the technology area, where there is no great regulation or compliance uh, that is in place. This is a relatively greenfield site in regulatory terms. That provides an opportunity, an opportunity I think to work with China above all, to try and have uh, a set of rules that works for the decades to come. But also it puts, I think, into perspective the real idea that actually leaving the European Union um, uh, means we are leaving behind a lot, of, a lot of rules in a whole range of uh, services and goods that will be uh, industries of the past rather than of the future. President Xi has committed to continuing China's economic opening up and the UK, I believe, is very well positioned to work with China on that journey, not least in relation to the hugely ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. We will continue to bring expertise in many areas that are key to China's plans, from our world-leading financial and professional services to cutting-edge scientific and creative industries. Indeed, I believe it was these assets that helped the Prime Minister to seal commercial deals worth over £9 billion during that visit back in February. And it's not just the big names that are getting on, in on the action. In the Prime Minister's largest ever business delegation, two in every three of the delegates represented a small or medium-sized enterprise, a really encouraging sign. I accept that that process will take a little longer than we might all hope, but we have to start somewhere, and I think that has been an encouraging development. I'm sure all of you are well aware that personal relationships are and will remain absolutely crucial to doing business in China. And that's why we work hard to maintain and develop those personal friendships between our cabinet and top leaders in China through regular policy dialogues and visits. I myself uh, met the party secretary of Shenzhen, uh, who was in London only last week, and I look forward, as I say, to visiting China and meeting my opposite numbers in Beijing, Shanghai, and elsewhere um, later in July. Plans are also in place for the Foreign Secretary and the Chancellor of the Exchequer to meet their opposition num numbers in Beijing very soon. And we hope that the Chinese Premier, uh, Li Keqiang, will be visiting the UK himself in the near future. Our network of five diplomatic posts, and please, may I ask all of you, please utilize that network, that FCO network of those five diplomatic posts on the Chinese mainland, hosting staff from no fewer than 18 different Whitehall departments. That helps us to identify opportunities, to build links, to build trust, confidence and ambition right across China. We want to open doors for all the businesses and sectors that wish to benefit, benefit from a win-win cooperation between our two countries. And I hope to visit many of those diplomatic posts on my forthcoming visits to China to continue promoting and supporting our work throughout the entirety of that nation. The relationships between our peoples, our communities, our institutions, and our business 
will be just as important to the success of the future partnership as this political engagement. And that's why I believe events such as this today are so very important in helping to make and also to build and put foundations towards those relationships. So if you haven't already done so, I very much hope you will use the opportunity today to plot your path towards closer links with China and become a part of this ever-growing success story. You can count on the support of this government, our diplomatic posts, and indeed me personally, to help fulfill all of those ambitions. Good luck. Sachi, um, distinguished guests, friends, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon and to address you. Um, indeed, it's, it's quite daunting in this, in this great space. I think we've heard um, in the earlier sessions about the background, the build-up of the political background to um, what I care about, which is actually doing business and doing business particularly with China. Um, I started on that road um, ooh, in the early 1980s at the beginning of an opening up. And by goodness me, how it's changed, how it's matured. The one thing you can guarantee is what happens today will not happen tomorrow. So you have to be very fickle. But I do believe, as uh, uh, Lord Sassoon mentioned earlier, that we are living in a very special time. It's very uncommon to have Chinese leaders talking about golden era, golden fruit, profound friendship. But the big question is, how do we move from those very high level objectives to real business opportunities? And that's really what my panel this afternoon is going to address. We are going to talk about the UK as an attractive destination for Chinese business, and indeed for China being an attractive destination for British business. Uh, we're going to give some examples of the challenges of expanding a business into China. Um, how big is the services industry really? Is it really opening up? And of course, you couldn't have an event like this, inviting business people to speak, if we don't mention Belt and Road which I think is the most significant strategic infrastructure proposition that the world has ever seen. How can the UK actually benefit from this amazing opportunity? Well, um, my panel is really outstanding. Um, I've asked them to actually draw from personal experience um, and give some concrete examples of things that they've done, perhaps things that have gone well and not so well so that we can learn for the future. So my first panellist, uh, Dr. Shang Bing, is no stranger to us here in London, founding dean at, uh, and professor of China Business and Globalisation at the Chung Kong Graduate School of Business. Um, he is a respected academic globally um, and has also served as a board member, um, independent board member, on a number of listed companies in Hong Kong, the mainland and indeed in the US. His research areas have uh, covered a wide band of business-related activity, uh, specifically in China, looking at state and business relations, reform of state-owned enterprises, and the role of the private sector in China's development. All matters which are pertinent to our discussion today. Sir, Gary, Sir Gary, Jerry Gimstone, I really need no introduction. He's one of the UK's most eminent business leaders. Of course, he chairs Standard Life Aberdeen and Barclays Bank PLC. Importantly, he also chairs Standard Life's joint venture in China, Hang On Standard Life, and I think he might make reference to his experiences there specifically. Sir Jerry has also given generously of his time supporting wider UK business initiatives, 
chairing the City UK CBBC China Market Advisory Group, which supports coordination of financial and professional service activity between China and the UK. We look forward to your contribution, sir. Well, Sherry Madeira, Sherry needs no introduction at all, really. I mean, this is her, her place, her town. Um, and of course, I think, as many of you know, she leads the City of London's policy and trade strategy for Asia. Um, and previously, as ex-minister, councillor, and director at our embassy in Beijing, promoting trade and investment between China and the UK, she um, particular, it paid particular attention to financial and business services and the technology centres. She's just returned from a trip to China and I look forward to hearing from her on her insights into the, challenging, the changing regulatory environment uh, relating to investment and, and doing business. And finally, but certainly not least, we are really pleased to have with us uh, Sun Yu, uh, General Manager of the Bank of China here in London, a great friend of the UK and leader of one of our most respected international banking institutions here in the city. Of course, the bank's been here for quite a long time. He's almost a London, a London resident. He should have citizenship, Mr. Sun. Um, but of course, before coming here, he had a number of senior roles in the bank. Uh, he spent a long time in, in Shanghai as Deputy General Manager and indeed in Hong Kong as the Head of the Portfolio Management Division in the Treasury Department. Now, there's some good news and some bad news about Mr. Sun being here today. Um, unfortunately, he's going to be leaving London and he will be sorely missed, but he is being taking up a very senior position in the bank and we look forward to inviting him back here to talk about his new position and to point out with his usual clarity um, what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. So, Mr. Sun, we're really grateful for you being here this afternoon. Now, that's enough from me. So, um, the format of the panel is very similar to one this morning. Um, I'm going to invite the panelists to speak for five minutes. We will have a discussion and then some time to um, to close out, giving each of our speakers a chance to, to make a short statement. So, Dr. Shah, would you like to start? Okay, thank you so much. I, for that. I think we'll sit down. Yes, yeah. uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, I have a three points to share at a philosophical level. Number one is one essential teaching Confucius. Harmony in diversity, or harmony without uniformity. In Chinese, we call it the herbotone. At a philosophical level, we're fundamenta fundamentally different from American philosophy, especially by Professor Fukuyama, the end of history argument. Given today, we have a confluence of so many transformative changes, whether technological, cultural, political, global governance, global trading systems. For the future, not going to be one system that will solve all the problems for all of us. Not be the one system to be better than the others. That's the central teaching of Confucius. You have to be different to be harmonious. I think we should stop trying to come up with one system that will solve all the problems for us. We should respect the differences. We should promote differences, different kinds of experiments for many of the challenges we have, so number one. Number two is also teaching. Now, so famous one, but also teaching from Confucius. In Chinese, we said, San zhi xing bi you wa shi, loosely translating, among the company of three, there must be one you can learn much from. So for the future, uh, we have to hide away some of our pride and prejudices. Be humble, uh, learn from each other. Today, really great occasion, you know, for me, for the Chinese, as a Chinese scholar, to appreciate the impact of the British on China's economic development. Why I say that? For the past three or four decades, there are three typhoons, typhoons, you know, and, and uh, one is a neoliberalism that's coming from Lady Thatcher in 1979. President Reagan was a big fan of Miss Thatcher. Neoliberalism all shaped, also shaped the China's reform in a fundamental way. China and the US embraced neoliberalism better than any countries, one might argue. 
the second typhoon, the new wave of globalization, the third typhoon, invention of internet. You can trace all of them here. China economy succeeded partly, maybe fundamentally because of the three typhoons. You know. So we owe a lot to the British, not only the Hong Kong ones. You know. uh, Hong Kong today is probably the best city in China with the rule of law. And uh, Shenzhen could become a global center for high-end manufacturing if you give another five, 10 years. But without Hong Kong, uh, difficult to envision all of that. You know. Thirdly, neoliberalism. Neoliberalism may has run its course in UK and the US, but neoliberalism has much, much room to develop for the future of China because we have so many sectors remain to be deregulated. Telecom, financial service, media, culture, and the creative sectors, many, many, many. China succeeded because of neoliberalism. China may become one of the most capitalist countries on earth, maybe the one, because we don't have universal health care. Our education system only covers ninth grade. We don't have unemployment insurance. We don't have a universal pension system. Our Gini coefficient, the measure of income inequality, for 2008 was 0.491 by Statistics Book of China, the governmental one. You look at many measures, you might argue China may have become one of the most capitalist country on earth. China succeeded because of that. China's challenges were income, wealth inequality, and the diminishing social mobility, partly may have derived from that as well. So for the future of China, China has much learned, not only from the experiment of the UK, in particular, these social welfare program of many of the European countries. I argue China succeeded use the combination of neoliberalism and state capitalism for the future. The social democracy of the European model has so much to offer. China continue to learn from that as well. Yes, China will offer many things for UK, some of the European countries to learn. For example, China may be the country that promoted much of the disruptions I'm talking about. Without disruptions, it's difficult to think about economic development. Because in China, you can tend wealth as the families. Look at that, for the past 30, 40 years, there's always a sea change, always a sea change. That's a fundamental difference between China's economy and India economy, maybe European economy. How do you facilitate this wave of disruptions? I think that's a key to the future. At the same time, how do you manage this income, wealth, inequality, and diminishing social mobility? Those are my two cents to begin with. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for inviting me here this afternoon. It's fantastic to see such a, a great crowd here. Um, I'm going to very quickly tell you what my credentials are for talking to you. Um, I think I'm the only global fortune, one of the very few global fortune 500 chairmen who also chairs their onshore business in China. Um, I have a, um, a pensions and savings, Salah like Aberdeen, we have a pensions and savings business in China, a joint, a joint venture with our friends in Xianjin. We employ nearly 10,000 people. We have over 9 million customers and I have branches in over 80 cities throughout China. And that's probably the largest, one of the largest geographical footprints of any Western financial services company in China. We have an asset management business in Shanghai, a wholly, for, wholly foreign owned enterprise selling investment products to, to, to our Chinese friends. Um, I first went to China over 25 years ago. I've been more than 200 times to China. I, I try to go to China every month. Um, I've been with the last four British Prime Ministers to China, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, and Theresa May. Um, I first went um, to help with state enterprise reform because in the 1980s I worked for Margaret Thatcher, particularly pleased to be here today because of that, and I was in charge of state enterprise reform in the United Kingdom. And the work I did then, a small group of experts were assembled by Zhu Ronji and 
we did the plan, which became the, um, the um, party's plan for state enterprise reform in the third plenary in 1993. Um, I'm an ex-banker, and always bankers like unique selling points. And I think my unique selling point has been that my father was a senior member of the UK Communist Party. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can imagine, as an ex-banker, I've magnified that to make it appear he was, he was on the long march with Chairman Mao. And this has stood me in very great stead always in, 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 in China. Um, so what's it like being the chairman of a business in China? First of all, um, thanks to the Confucian hierarchy, it's wonderful fun being a chairman in China. Um, I speak to my general manager um, every, every few days, and he will start his speech by saying, Chairman, I would like to give you a full report of what, we, what I have done since we last spoke. On Monday morning I did this, on Monday afternoon I did this. I say this to my UK CEOs, and they look at me in astonishment <laughs> as to how could that possibly be a way of conducting a business. But what it shows is, to my mind, is the tight unification you see um, in, in Chinese companies. Um, the board of our company is, because it's a 50-50 joint venture, it's 50-50 Chinese and, 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 and colleagues from, 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 from Britain. We run it to exactly the same standards of corporate governance as we do our businesses in the UK. And we are regularly marked top by the CIRC for governance and regulation in China. That's been very important because quality has become increasingly important in China. The China consumer has become very litigious. We are frequently taken to court by individual Chinese customers throughout the country complaining about the terms of a policy or whether our surrender values have been fair or what have you. This has become a very consumer savvy aware society. My people work extraordinarily hard. They will work six days a week, seven days a week, but with a tremendous loyalty and a tremendous spirit to want to improve themselves and, and, and work hard. Um, of course, and I'm on record of saying that the stability of China for a company like myself is an important factor in operating there. Um, I won't say how much we're looking forward to that same level of predictability coming back into the United Kingdom. I mean, sort of, um, sort of market. Because predictability for a business is very important. Of course, there are laws and regulations, no better, no worse than here. The insurance regulator, soon to be the insurance and banking regulator, is just as skilled as the regulators are here, a different approach, but just as skilled. And China has been very good at sucking in regulatory experience from around the world and redeploying it in the Chinese context. Um, there are any insurance people in the room. The Chinese version of Solvency II, CROS, was adopted in four or five years. I mean, by then, where it took us, you know, having learned from us and others, um, a lot longer to, to do that. Um, we benefit greatly from the, um, the golden era of UK-China relationships. I keep my fingers crossed that the Dalai Lama doesn't pay a surprise visit to the United Kingdom <laughs> because even in a golden era of Chinese relationships, one is always conscious that there is a political environment in which we are operating. And that goes for the same, I think, for both, 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 um, both countries. I absolutely support British companies um, operating there. It is complicated. You have to put in the time, as I do. You have to be prepared to you know, build personal relationships. The one thing I won't do is to eat sea cucumber. I think there's a limit to how far you can push personal relationships. <laughs> but other than that, when I'm in China, of course I live the life of my Chinese friends. I drink baijiu, and in the insurance business you have to drink a lot of baijiu. <laughs> And I join in, and again, I think that is very much an important ingredient 
of success in China, which is whilst preserving our standards, our governance, our approach to business, and not relaxing those at all, at all. We are absolutely as conscious of treating customers fairly in those standards in China as we are in the UK, but we do it in the Chinese way to our standards. And I think that's an interesting kind of maxim to take with us today if one wants to be successful in China. Thank you, Gary. Uh, well, Sir Jerry, as always, a hard act to follow. Um, but uh, I think that we agreed that uh, we were going to start thinking about the opportunities in China. And uh, you'll forgive me uh, if I focus primarily on financial and professional services, uh, what with this, uh, me carrying a city card. Uh, I, I should actually say thank you. Welcome uh, to all of you uh, to, to the Guild Hall. Uh, it's not surprising to me at all that we're sitting here in this venue. Uh, some might say, you know, this is so steeped in tradition. You know, there's so much history here. And yet we're talking about the future of a relationship with, with China, which is very much new, changing, and evolving. Uh, but actually, that, uh, that uh, partnership of the old and the new, I think, is one of the things that reinforces what Jerry was saying about trying to pull together and be able to learn from each other, different cultures, appreciation. Um, but I think that we're actually in a really interesting time at the moment, particularly from a financial services perspective. Um, there has been quite a few number of decades uh, that we've been talking to China uh, and trying to collaborate in terms of being able to get access to that huge and growing Chinese marketplace for financial services. Uh, and already, you know, seeing that uh, Sun Yu and, and other Chinese banks have been doing great business here in the city, you know, we're, we're really welcoming that collaboration back here in London. Um, and why I say we're, we're in a step change is, is I think that when we look at what's happened recently, um, you know, Jerry was at the Boao Forum uh, uh, recently where President Xi announced some reforms, um, and I was very uh, honored to be there as well. And I think that it became one of those moments that we'll look back on as being a pivotal point that China not only talks about reforms and talks about how it is that we're going to embrace uh, opening up and capital market uh, efficiency, but actually it was starting to happen right there in front of us. Um, and what I mean by that is there were a no series of very specific announcements uh, that were made by both President Xi and, and, and redoubled on the next day by the new governor of the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, Yi Gong. Uh, and those included the ability for foreign institutions to come into China and own 100%. So those caps about ownership had pretty much been lifted or a path to 100% ownership was very much uh, supported and announced during that time period. You know, frankly, I'm not sure what we're going to do in our next economic and financial dialogue because these were some of the things we've been asking for for many years. Uh, but if you think about uh, the insurance, if you think about insur securities companies, banking, asset management, these are all now opening to foreign investors without having to have a minority stake. And this has been something that hopefully will encourage our markets here to take China out of that too difficult box and at least think again about what the opportunities are there as the reforms are changing. Um, there's also quite uh, significant uh, changes to the, uh, what is currently a impermeable capital account. So the stock connect, the bond connect, which are currently up and running with uh, the Shanghai Hong Kong Connect, the Shenzhen Hong Kong Connect for equities, and also the Bond Connect for, uh, for fixed income, all on that day were announced to go up by fourfold in terms of quotas. So I think there was a real demonstrable interest in opening up and encouraging foreign investors to really participate in those marketplaces. Um, of course, the Chinese bond market is the third largest in the world, and that's growing rapidly. Uh, already, the floor, doors were flung open. When I was living in Beijing, we were all taken a bit by surprise at how open that bond market became, um, and the announcement came very quickly. However, the stampede of international investors into that bond market hasn't quite happened yet. And of course, this is becoming a narrative, a dialogue, a journey uh, for us to work very closely with Chinese colleagues, policymakers, institutions, to find out ways that are, it's not just about opening up. 
It's about education. It's about creating efficiency and making sure that some of those barriers to the real business, for example, profitability, um, become known to the, the very experienced, and I totally concur with Jerry, very, very educated and uh, knowing regulators that are managing an incredibly complicated market opening up in China. There's also specific reference during that Baowao speech for things that are new opportunities for international players. Things like payments, like credit rating agencies, like credit cards, like clearing systems. These are all references now being able to be opening up for foreign participation. So if we're thinking about, well, what's different between now and this time last year, there are real opportunities for foreign players to come into the Chinese market quite significantly. Of course, foreign exchange reforms and that opening up of the capital account are going to be critical. As we all know, there's been a very tight capital market right now with China. Uh, that's something that has uh, persisted since 2015. Um, some of our great asset managers who have boldly gone in and insurance companies that have gone in uh, to China are still waiting on quotas to be able to make the most of that ownership and that structure. Uh, and actually, from my trip last week and speaking to uh, both the, the government as well as regulators and participants in the market, you know, these challenges are well known. These are not things that are not being discussed. They're in fact being actively pursued in terms of asking for interest, guidance, suggestions, collaboration. Um, and we're very proud here in the City of London to be seen as being a global financial center that can provide some of this suggestion, not only from our big UK financial institutions and advisors and ecosystem, but because we are also incorporating those of our international counterparts. Uh, JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, uh, BNP Paribas. You know, some might say, oh, well, that's, you know, is that a city institution? Of course it is. That is what makes us global, and that is what we're also sharing with China to make sure that that path towards reform becomes something that's appreciated by international investors. Um, I think that the devil is in the detail. Uh, I don't want anyone to, uh, to say, wow, she's, uh, you know, she's uh, all, all positive on this. You know, certainly, I, I think that there will be um, some bumps in the road. Uh, I think that it means that we need to be even more communicating what it is that uh, industry needs and what uh, the real economy is actually looking for in terms of raising funds in various denominations. But certainly, as the largest center for uh, RMB offshore here in London, um, it's something that we know a bit about. Um, foreign exchange, uh, we do the most foreign exchange of anywhere in the world. Um, that's been the case for many decades, uh, and hopefully it will be the same to in, in many decades to come. And it's something we can collaborate again with China, thinking about how it is that slowly, surely, safely, and logically, that market can open up both the foreign exchange flotation and rates uh, across the borders. Um, I do want to say uh, something about the Belt and Road, uh, because I can't believe I've spoken for a few minutes and not mentioned it yet. Um, having been in China last week, I timed it. Uh, the longest it took for someone to mention it in the room in any meeting was four and a half minutes. So I think the point that uh, Peter made earlier about it being very important and, and strategic going forward is absolutely right. Uh, Chinese counterparts are looking at how they can support <coughs> this big, ambitious initiative. However, there is no roadmap. Uh, so it's something that to be inspiring and something to be inspired by, um, as opposed to following a rote as to what happens next. So I think that there are opportunities for this, this marketplace to engage, for, for the UK to share some knowledge and learn at the same time. And I, I think there are five of those we can concentrate on outside of the fact that we're already a big financial market that has deep liquid markets. The first is green finance. The second is that foreign exchange and RMB conversion ability to be here in, in London. The third is legal services and thinking about how the rule of law can help and apply across a huge swathe of the world. Uh, insurance and risk management. London is a very recognized uh, leader in, in world insurance and specialty insurance. And finally, that project advisory and design. Notice I don't really mention the, you know, the, the, the shovels and the hard hats and the, and the uh, you know, construction. Because, goodness, there are incredible skills and efficiencies that are already going on in China. My point is, let's try and find where it is that we can add value and how it is that we can be involved so that we're actually real partners in making that a success. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, so finally it's my turn. So <laughs> it's always difficult to be the last one to make the adjustment. 
in the panel because not too much left for you to talk about. But the good thing is that I have the cues to make it really short. <laughs> Today we got the topic doing business in China. Maybe we should mention doing business with China because here what we are mentioning is not only doing business in China but also doing business in UK with China. So every people may have a different perspective in understanding the China-UK relationship. You know, from as a ban Chinese banker being based here in London, I always believe that what behind the golden era or the so-called relationship actually is a strong, you know, the fundamentals, which is actually, you know, the, the big picture of China's internationalization. You know, this year is the 30 years anniversary for China to start to pursue the policy and the open reform. And you know, very recently, you know, President Xi emphasized that the, open, the door of the Chinese open up will not be closed and will open even wider in our forum. I think that's a very clear message that the internationalization of the Chinese economy will continue and even accelerate. And given the size of the Chinese economy and given how deeply China is already involved in the international division of labor, so we can imagine the impact and the opportunities brought by Chinese internationalization is huge. The, the opportunities offered is, are enormous. And do not forget, UK historically did a great job in embracing newcomers in international business. Talking about financial industry, you know, both US banks and the Japanese banks started their international business here in London, here in, U here in city, and eventually made London the hub to cover the, you know, to hub, to cover the old EMEA business or even the global business. So that's, uh, that's uh, you know, the big fun fundamental between China and the UK relationship. You know, looking ahead, you know, we, China has a lot, we can talk about the new era of China's internationalization. You see lots of different characteristics. You can talk about the transformation from uh, speed China to quality China. As Sir Jerry just now mentioned, the Chinese people are searching for high quality products and, and the service. China is becoming the biggest consumption market in the world. We have the so-called 200 million or 300 million middle-class people in China. And you know, that kind of a transformation can offer great opportunity to UK, of course. And we are talking about the RMB internationalization. Currently, the focus actually is the open up of the onshore capital market. As you know, Sherry mentioned, we got the second largest equity market, although sometimes the performance are not very good. We have the third largest fixed income market, an open up of the onshore capital market means hugely to market players here in London. And you can talk, of course, talk about Belt and Road. I think in the past few years, UK did a great job in embracing all the opportunities offered by this process. And looking ahead, in the area I mentioned just now, I, I think there's still lots of potential UK can do. Of course, UK is equally valuable to China as well, because when China is going international, we also need the platform, need the right counterparties. I think that's a fundamental reason why you know, we have so many matching points between the two countries. I try to make it very short. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chief. Well, we've talked to the, uh, quite a bit about this huge market in professional services, uh, finance in particular. How big do you think it really is for the UK um, as a special partner? Do we have any, um, any attributes other than the City of London that make us uh, the best player on the block for China to collaborate with? Perhaps Mr. Sun, you might. Yeah, maybe you can, we must uh, you know, understand in the broader you know, the perspective. For example, talking about the internalization of the Chinese banks. Bank of China, as you introduced, we've been here for 90 years. But currently, we've got more than 10 Chinese banks opening branch or subsidiary here in London. But even now, if you combine all Chinese banks together, of asset are still below 1% one, one, 1 of the banking assets here in London, which is not you know, the match with the overall size of Chinese banks. ICBC is being called the biggest bank in the universe, in the university. You know? So all Chinese banks are huge. But I would say we are just at the very initial stage to go international, even for Bank of China. You know, so we are a tiny portion in terms of overall profitability here in London. Then the question is, how we go international? You know, the London city is an ideal place for us to choose it as a hub, to be the email center. Then I have to talk about Brexit. I'm surprised that nobody talking about Brexit. 
you know, that ongoing and time-consuming expensive divorce means uncertainty and the cost for all the business. For Chinese banks, we are so unique. For all the other banks, they are already very large here in London. I think it's relatively easy for us to make a decision because they just want to minimize the actions they must take regarding the Brexit. You know, of course, they have to take some. For us, we are not utilizing the passporting a lot. But for the future consolidation of our business, it's getting more difficult. So that's why, you know, talking about that particular topic, I think how to handle the uncertainty and making the business environment more predictable is something very important. Mm -hmm. But think about the size of all Chinese banks. It's not surprising the following five years, we are becoming 5% or even 10% of the banking assets here, which means five times or 10 times bigger than our current size. That means a lot for the financial industry here in, here in London, that's for sure. Thank you. Jerry. Uh, well, there's a number uh, that uh, the China Market Advisory Group put <coughs> together thinking, well, what about the Belt and Road? You know, it seems to be the, the driving um, uh, initiative on, on, on some of the thinking around China. Uh, how much is that worth to, to the UK? Uh, and um, uh, those much more clever than I uh, quoted 1.8 billion per year additional GDP to the UK economy on engagement in the Belt and Road. Uh, now, I mean, even if that isn't the right number, it starts giving you some inspiration that this is something that we need to start thinking about, and a lot of that does come from services. You know, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that the UK is a strong service economy, uh, and I think that we can add an incredible amount of value to that. Uh, of course, you know, we're, that's, that's something that is often not just in China. You know, it's about third countries, so it's about that collaboration and really expanding the relationship. So it's not just going into China when we talk about these things. It's about collaboration along the Belt and Road. I'll give you two quick examples from my area. Um, you look at um, investment, portf investment portfolios in China. They're still massively undiversified internationally. <coughs> but it's not so many years ago where the Chinese um, insurance companies, Chinese banks, were obliged just to invest in China. Now, eventually, because of the need to diversify risk, maybe 20% of Chinese investment portfolios will be overseas. What opportunity for London you know, to manage that money coming out of China to invest globally? Um, Sherry and myself, we're constantly positioning London as being one of the global great gateways for China. Um, my company, Standard Life Aberdeen, we have some hopes to be the first foreign company to be given a pensions license in China. Um, like many other countries in the world, the, even with as many resources as in China, the government can now offer what used to be called the Iron Rice Bowl, where the Chinese government would provide everything for its citizens. Um, things are having to be transferred to the private sector. Imagine what the size of the private pension industry is going to be in China in due course once that happens. And you can replicate these, these points over many sectors, many, many companies and industries. Well, I have a few points to share. Uh, number one, this is four or five years ago. I was giving a talk to this country manager, European companies, American company in Shanghai. And uh, during the coffee break, the, the, the French, the Swiss company came over and said, well, it costs 20% more to manufacture in the city neighboring Shanghai, Kunshan, than what we do in France. I said, well, then why you invest in China? Why you make them in China? And then they said, because after 2008, China, by far the largest fast-growing market for them, we have to make the product close to the market. Mm. So the China story itself has become the market itself, not its low-cost manufacturing now. That's number one. Number two, the, the, the British expertise, I think the relevance of that to China go way beyond the financial services. You look at the supply side uh, reform in China, whether it is uh, the technology side or industrial design side, UK has so much talent and expertise to offer, you know. And, and, uh, and, and thirdly, uh, you know, this is uh, one American companies, you know, we had a dinner together, the global chairman said, well, and what do you teach? I teach globalization Chinese company to the Chinese audience. They said, well, I have interest in that as well. I said, why? I said, you Chinese, not very experienced going global. We don't need to compete in China. We can go global together. We can go to Africa market, you know, the other emerging together. We are, we are far more experienced than you are. I bet the British companies 
can, has so much to offer as well. Even for the Chinese company to go global, mm. they have to be become IBM, G, HSBC, you know, insurance companies here. So I think not just the belt road, but the whole process going global. I'm very positive. The, you know, there are a lot of opportunities to collaborate between the Chinese and the British companies. Yes. Thanks very much. Maybe I, could I ask uh, our Chinese panelists a specific question? Um, Mr. Tim, what, what surprised you when you first came? What was the biggest sort of surprise for you when you came and set up your, took responsibility for your business here in London? That's a good question, actually. You need to wear different clothes. You sometimes need black tie, sometimes white tie. So. <laughs> 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 but anyway, for, for any Chinese business going really international, normally we choose Lon Hong Kong as a first stop. You know, to start the international business. I still that's why Hong Kong still offers great value for Chinese business to start the international business. But London should be the ideal stop for the, uh, the next stop to going truly global. Even for Bank of China, we've been here for 90 years. You know, the, uh, we got the perfect mixture of our staff. We got you know the local Chinese, local non Chinese, and uh, less than 10 percent expat staff. But uh, for a manager like me, I've been working in Hong Kong for seven and a half, half years. You know. It's still quite a challenge for me first came here. I think, you know, the true difficulty is that, you know, you cannot use uh, the practice in, in, in mainland China, even in Hong Kong, to do business here. For example, you know, the, to be frank, you know, when I'm in China, you know, the, you may ask your staff to work longer times, but here for the local staff, it's getting more difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes for the mandate from, from the headquarters, I think I'm just acting as a kind of a cushion, you know, because I need to try yeah. to tailor made into the practice here to make sure it gets implemented. But meanwhile, it's in the style of the UK here. Mm -hmm. So of course, you know, speak English every day is not easy. You know, for my 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 my, my it's, it's my native language is still Mandarin. That's that's also a challenge to be frank for us of Chinese staff. You know, the culture is different as well. But all in all, I think if you have the ambition to become a truly international business, you must have the ambition and the courage to embrace, to be localized. I think that's something extremely important. Mm. Yeah. You're right. Dr. Shah, you're, you're an independent director on American companies. What, what did you find the most shocking? Well, I have a lot of respect for my American friends, especially <laughs> in the nation, in terms of the ability to innovate, the ingenuity. They have done so many good things for humanity, no doubt about that. But sometimes, I find their thinking is more like a cultural revolution, sometimes in the box, you know, always uniformity. You know, I mean, they, they have done a lot of wonderful things, but, uh, but when I come to Europe, I feel at home, firstly, you know, so much cultural heritage, that's China. Because in Chinese standard, we have 3,000, 5,000 year civilization. Every major dynasty, 300 years a dynastic change. U.S. has yet a complete first cycle yet in that standard, you know. So <laughs> that is true, you know. So, so I mean, if Europe, I feel at home. You know, there's this diversity, the history, the cultural heritage. You can look at the issue long term, really long term, you know. And then, then I, I, I like all of that. And then, then in 2006, my first time to real socialist countries like Sweden. Denmark. I said, oh my God, I love socialism. This is real. This is real socialism. <laughs> so I don't need a government or party to preach about socialism. After the experiment, you know, I, I, I embrace socialism wholeheartedly, you know. And, and, uh, but when I see the competition from US and China, arguably two capitalistic blocks, putting too much pressure on Europe, I see that's the key fundamental imbalance of the global economy. I hope AI may save socialism one day. So I have a lot of affection for Europe, not only the culture and the history side, but also you know, the, this base for socialism in terms of income, wealth, inequality, in terms of human dignity, in terms of fairness, in terms of where we're living, you know, American innovates too, too much, Chinese, we work too hard. Many of us would like to spend money after we die. You know, we work so hard, you know, that's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem, <laughs> sometimes. But I, but I do think the Chinese culture is changing. I mean, you had another holiday on Monday, and I just can't work. But basically speaking, like, we still work too hard. We save too much sometimes. In America, they don't want to save, you know? It's a, sometimes, this is a complimentary, but Trump, yeah. President Trump doesn't see it that way, you know? No, no he doesn't. <laughs> now, if, if there was sort of one thing that we could do in the UK to 
actually engage more positively with China. What, what do you think it would be, Jim? I think it is to understand them more. I mean, as we've heard, the Chinese have a great sense of history, a great sense of humor. Um, they are, in a sense, fascinated by the United Kingdom because if you sit in a schoolroom in China and look at a map of the world, every country puts itself at the center mm. of that map of the world. On a Chinese map of the world, Great Britain is a tiny island in the top left-hand corner of the map. Yes. <laughs> it is as far away from the center of the world as you can possibly imagine. And the Chinese think it very, very curious. How did somewhere so far away from the center become so powerful? What is the ingredient that is manufactured up there? So they're constantly looking to understand us. And I think equally, we have to constantly look to understand them. Um, and that is a complex thing. I mean, in China, no matter how many times you go there, it's like one of those video games where you can get into another room, but there's <laughs> always another room beyond the room which you're in. And that, I find, is the intellectual fascination of it. I don't know whether you feel the same thing. Yes, I do. But you're never, you never feel that you completely understand it. So I think all of us going down that journey as to how we can understand it better is important. What do you think, Jim? Um, I, I agree. I think it's all about sharing. Um, but I think that we're in, in a shift. I mean, 10 years ago, first time I went to China was 2003. And it was all about uh, you know, teaching China best practices, um, telling China how it was done uh, in the West. Uh, and actually, I just find every time uh, I'm, I'm in China, I spend 50% of my time uh, in Asia, uh, and I learn something in a new way every time I'm there. Uh, and of course, you don't need to travel there. You just need to be open to hearing about what's, what's happening. And I think particularly in this uh, next phase, in the next five years, I think we need to do as much listening as we're doing talking so that we can understand how it is that we can bridge what's happening in opening up. You know, Jerry's point about how, how, when you think about all of these new opportunities that are going to be coming out and being able to be accessed, um, we need to understand from both perspectives, you know, how things like standards, how things like uh, regulations, how things like culture all play a key role in making sure that everyone does good business together uh, and that also that we maintain so sort of good, strong ties that have already been established. You know, in terms of sort of the direction of travel, I think President Xi has opened that direction of travel. You know, it is towards opening up. And as Sun Yu said, uh, you know, the, the question is wider and even with more pace. So we know the direction of travel. We know, so, you know, for financial services, who's driving the car. You know, the new governor, Yi Gong, is in that driving seat. Um, mm -hmm. And earlier this year, at Bo Ao, the accelerator was pressed. So I think that we need to buckle up, and I think we need to listen to what's going on there. Mm. Mr. Sun, from a Chinese perspective, what do we need to do better? Of course, maybe two points. You know, the macro one, I think, you know, the, uh, just talk about Brexit. I think for the financial industry, definitely this, is, this uncertainty is something, you know, we need to handle, as soon as, handle it as soon as possible. Otherwise, it's difficult for the decision making sometimes. Microly, I, I think you know, immigration is still an issue. You know, the, today I had a lunch with a Chinese girl who is studying in King's University here, college. Uh, she told me in his class, he, her is uh, you know, the major in the statistics. In her class, they got 60% Chinese overseas students. It's quite a surprise, 60% Chinese. But I guess none of them can stay in UK after graduation. I think it's a waste of resources. Mm. You know, those guys got this bilingual, bicultural skill, but the current visa policy is so difficult for them to stay. I think it's definitely, you know, it's a, it's a waste of resources. And it's, they are extremely, as a next generation, I think they are extremely important for the future relationship between the two countries. I think you're absolutely right. A lot of us in this room uh, agree with you entirely. We've just got to keep the pressure up, I think. <laughs> Dr. Xiao. Well, I... In 2005, our business school brought in humanities, history, religion, philosophy to the curriculum degree, non-degree program. We did that not only for business school. That's my belief for future. 
the seeds of humanity is far more important than management, process, governance, finance, all of that. Because the humanities will help us to understand each other better. To me, probably the single most challenge for China's rise globally is the value connection. In order to do that well, it's the humanities, not a technology, not a management, not just simple process, or even governance. You know? And then so the sense of humanity will help us broaden our horizons, have a better understanding of each other, appreciation of each other, positive aspect. That's my two cents. Thank, Thank you, you very much. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good point. Um, Belton Road, Jerry, do you see direct opportunity for, for your businesses at the moment, or is it something that will come in the future? I mean, Bel Belton Road, and I know we're having a, another speaker subsequently, so I won't talk in too much detail about it. It is an enormous project, as Sherry said, for, for, for China. But it's a project, of course, which has a number of connotations as far as China is concerned. I mean, one is, and let's be blunt about it, and there's nothing wrong, you know, Britain does the same, has done the same thing in the past. It's a way of extending Chinese political connectivity into other countries. You build a railway in a country, you lend that country money to build that railway, and of course it naturally is, you have someone there who is a friend of China, perhaps, going forward. We would do exactly the same thing in the past. I mean, secondly, I mean, China, of course, has a lot of infrastructure capacity. Um, it's been enormously successful putting infrastructure down in China. Why not use some of that capacity to put down infrastructure elsewhere, being the second point? The third point, of course, there are some you know, potential security issues attached with it. But again, just the same things that we would have done or the Americans would have done in the past. And fourthly, and most importantly, you put in primary infrastructure, of course it, it benefits, it gives rise to economic activity. And I think for British companies, we have some fine companies like Arup who are much involved in infrastructure, now uh, are doing a tremendous business out of it. Um, for companies like ours, um, it's almost the secondary economic activity which this will create which is the important investment opportunities. Many of the countries which Belt and Road go through and which the British government have identified as being key partners to ourselves are countries which we have very long, strong, strong historic relationships. Think about Crossrail going into East London, into Stratford, and think about the economic activity building something like Crossrail develops in that part of London. Equally, you know, I believe there's tremendous investment opportunities arising from the Chinese generosity in a sense, putting in the primary infrastructure, the amount of investment opportunities which come to us from that. I think it's harder to find opportunities to invest in the core Chinese infrastructure, but I think certainly the ancillary infrastructure which countries then need to put in to take full use of the core infrastructure I think that's a really, really exciting opportunity for, for the United Kingdom. I agree entirely. This is not just a one-stage concrete farmer's dream. This is about all of the opportunities that that creates. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mr. Sun, you've got the last slot. So I'm going to invite everybody to make two points uh, to <laughs> draw our um, attentive audience's attention to at the end of the session. So you get the first shot. You mean just the two points? Yes. <laughs> okay, I, I think uh, maybe I will talk about Belt and Road. I try, it's very short, you know. I think Belt and Road is an idea proposed by China to be shared with the rest of the world. From the commercial perspective, I think, you know, the Belt and Road, you know, the biggest, uh, biggest problem is how to manage the risk. That's why I think London is in a very unique position to play the role as a solution provider, because you do have the expertise here. Secondly, I think the reason why London is a global leading financial center is only because it's international and inclusive. So I do think it can remain international and inclusive. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sun. Sherry. Um, I'm not sure if we've talked today enough about green finance and sustainability. Um, I think that Belt and Road Initiative is a big, impactful, ambitious project, and getting it right should include making sure that it is not detrimental to environmental and social standards. 
Uh, and that's something I think uh, that the Chinese are very, very keen to work and collaborate on. So I think that's an important point. Um, and the second one is to think about, uh, you know, the ch taking the point further, what's the point of the Belt and Road? Well, the other big initiative that, uh, that China has is Made in China 2025. Uh, well, when you think about generating some of those higher value products and how it is that those, in, uh, those transport uh, and, and intellectual links start building up the, the ways of those products getting out into the other markets, it starts becoming quite logical. And then those other ancillary opportunities start becoming interesting for businesses in the UK. I'll tell one very short story. Um, I was with um, Prime Minister Gordon Brown when he met Premier Wen Jiabao. And um, our Prime Minister, to break the ice, said, I've got a very important statistic to tell you, Premier. We now have 20,000 children in British schools learning Chinese. <coughs> Wen Jiabao looked at him and he said, that's very interesting, Prime Minister. We have 50 million children in Chinese schools <laughs> learning English. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, Much work to do. You see. And then, uh, well, firstly, I have to say something about the Belt Road. I, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in, uh, you know, with my father. Then I've I been to many the poorest area of China. And then, if you go by the Chinese experience, if you don't have infra infrastructure, you have nothing to talk about. When there's a road, bridge, airport, we can talk about second, third level of development. It's necessary, okay, let's not argue about that. Whatever, whatever nation, they need infrastructure, okay. And there's enough statistic on the demand for infrastructure, you know. And, and uh, even on the infrastructure front, there's a lot of things maybe British can contribute. Why, why example, you compare the Beijing airport and the Hong Kong airport, see the difference, go to experience. You know, Beijing airport, so terrible, you know, I mean, you go inside, so convenient, take you months. In minutes to get over where you want to go, you know. So the Hong Kong one is much better. They look at the same from all sides, but inside, huge difference. I presume the British had a more influence Hong Kong airport. You know, I just uh, uh, you have a lot of expertise to contribute. You know, and, and then and you know then the next layer of service will come up from. You know, I think there's a lot of interest for uh, British to play. And then the second point on the people front, I think, especially the chairman, the CEO, uh, according to the experience of our school. Uh, you need to have some program together, even one or two days, not just a forum. No media, no nothing, you know, you, you, you more frankly debate about your concern, you know, and, 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 and you become real friends, you know. Uh, that will accelerate uh, the, the negotiations and understanding of each other. So that's our experience, whether it was the Japanese, with the Koreans, you know. After this, even one or two days, uh, uh, the program, they, they, they become much better connected. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we can work on. To me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chung. Well, it just remains for me to have, have the chairman's last word. Um, I really don't think you can underestimate the importance of the golden era. It sounds awfully trite to us, but wherever I go in China, the people you deal with are aware of this special relationship. And it makes an excellent starting point for a business dialogue. So I think my message to everybody is, let's get on and bake the best of it while we've still got it. <laughs> yes. Because others are very, very envious of the relationship that we have. So it just remains to me, on your behalf, to thank your panellists. I think they've done a sterling job this afternoon. I hope you'll agree with me. So please join me in thanking them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.